Hey everybody, this is the Sliders Review, and welcome to a special edition of Asian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And I'm here today to talk to you about Batman, Soul of the Dragon. This came out in 2021. I like to think of this movie as Bruce Lee Enters the Dragon meets Netflix's The Defenders because you know there's a lot of similarities and stuff and it's very uncanny so like this was executive produced by bruce tim it's directed by sam Liu, and it's an original story so basically around the time the new 52 movies were coming out in animation i forget the abbreviation is dc am or dc amu or something like that you know the ones that are based on the new 52 movies so those were coming out around this time and well they started to decline towards the middle and the end so every once in a while they would insert a brand new movie that's not connected to that timeline or that continuity and stuff and normally when they did this those movies turned out great and this movie is freaking cool man this is such an awesome movie and everything and so you're probably wondering okay well why do you have your like you know asian um heritage like you know pacific islander like template and everything well this is you know mostly an asian inspired like movie also because of that of richard dragon who they race bent to be asian in this movie now the huge debate that i'm still trying to figure out in my head is who exactly is the main star of this movie now i know it's a ragtag group of vigilantes and villains from the comics but they're anti-heroes in the movie but is it Batman or is it Richard Dragon and everything? Because I've said this before in another video that I made a, while, a couple of months back that one thing DC Animation likes to do is when they want to showcase a superhero group or a superhero or a supervillain group that is either well known or not well known they like to insert people like batman or like the justice league into their movies and stuff or like superman and stuff that's normally what they like to do because they feel that those movies can't do well if they don't insert somebody in that people know this is what happened with justice league dark they shoehorned batman into that movie and he had no business being in that movie because justice league dark is a separate group of the justice league that deals with like magic and batman don't do magic and it's similar to Batman Assault on, Ar on Arkham, which is supposed to be about Task Force X, the S Squad like group. And it's based on like, you know, the Arkham movies. That's how they shoehorn Batman into that movie when it's technically a Task Force X movie and everything. And so this is what they like to do, and they did it once again. So even though this movie is primary, um, it, 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 so it's like, okay, so they shoehorn Batman into this movie when it's technically supposed to be about Richard Dragon and everything. But then the question is the debate of like, you know, who exactly um, is the center focus of this movie? Is it Batman? Is it Richard Dragon? There's no definitive answer to that because the movie uh, revolves around both, but it tends to revolve around Batman slightly more. See, in the present day, it revolves around Richard Dragon, but in all the flashbacks, and there are tons of flashbacks, it mostly revolves around Batman, a young Bruce Wayne, as he's training to be Batman and everything. And so, you know, it kind of sucks that this movie could have did very well without Batman, but I can understand people's skepticism because of the simple fact Batman is the only one who wears a costume in this movie. All the rest of like the villain vigilante type people, they just wear regular clothes. 
And so Batman literally could have just been Bruce Wayne in this entire movie and just been Batman for like a minute. And it would have been fine with me. And also it would have been fine with me if they just would have showcased the vigilantes and villains and just leave Batman on out of it. But, you know, either way, you know, like I said before, I'm satisfied. But it is kind of bizarre that, like, he's wearing, like, you know, a costume and everybody else is not. And this is why I say it reminds me of Netflix's um, Defenders. The Netflix Marvel division had their own, like, group of heroes and stuff. And they decided to combine to become a group known as the Defenders, which was kind of like their Avenger-type, like, event. Some people liked it, some people did not. One thing that stood out is that all our heroes wore regular clothes and Daredevil was the only one who wore like, you know, um, a costume. <laughs> <laughs> which was really weird and kind of bizarre and made him stand out but he had to wear a costume to protect his identity and this is kind of how this is as well and then when i say there are parallels i'm not even joking so you have batman who is technically daredevil in this movie you have Lady Shiva, who is technically Jessica Jones in this movie. You have the Bronze Tiger, who is technically Luke Cage in this movie. And you have, um, what is it? Um, I'll get into Richard Dragon later. There's another one in here, Jade, technically Sherish. But she's not really like in this movie that much because she dies in like a flashback. Um, I guess she could be that one. I forget her name, but she's that one Asian female character from the Iron Fist show. So she could be her and stuff like that. And then, of course, you have like, you know, Richard Dragon, who is technically the um, Iron Fist of this movie. And why do I say that? Because one, they're both like, you know, skilled martial artists. They're both known as like the greatest martial artists in their respected comic books and everything. And because of the debate on race. See, um, Danny Rand, who is the Iron Fist, is white. Uh, Richard Dragon is also white. And this became a huge controversial debate a couple of years ago when Iron Fist got his own show because they cast a white guy because, you know, he's white in the comics. And many fans said that, you know, maybe he should be race bent to Asian because of the simple fact it's weird that like a white guy is considered the greatest martial artist of all time in the comic. And like, you know, his costume is Asian based. He resides in a fictional Asian, like, you know, um, magical type land and everything where he learns martial arts and all this other stuff. They said it when they said, you know, the comics were written so many decades ago when white people were the main focus. So they said, you know, maybe he should be Asian. And so when they made him white, that upset a lot of people to so where in the second season, they decided to focus more on the Asian female character and make her the new Iron Fist instead of um, Danny, who was still in the show, but you know. So for Soul of the Dragon, they decided, hey, let's just race bin him to Asian because it's a similar thing that happened with the um, Iron Fist thing. But then not only that, but they decided, hey, let's base him on Bruce Lee. <laughs> because when you watch it, you think you're looking at Bruce Lee and everything. And Richard Dragon has appeared in live action before. He was in the Arrowverse on the Arrow show. But they race bent him to be Hispanic and changed his name to Ricardo Dragon and stuff. Should have went just Asian. <laughs> and I think that version was completely different from this one. Because there's two different Richard Dragons in like the comics and stuff. One was kind of like a good guy and the other one's kind of more like a villain. But you know. And so this is an interesting ragtag of a movie that like, you know, showcases vigilantes and villains. 
But what's really neat about this movie is like, it's set in the 1970s and you get that 1970s type music. You get the like walking, like, you know, the stereotypical like movie, like, ah, 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 stay like staying alive type thing. But you know, it's like, you know, it really feels like a 1970s kung fu action movie you got afros you have asian people you have traditional asian garments um you have jive talking and stuff all that jive slang and everything like oh you jive turkey <laughs> and everything and it's so funny when the one dude's like what the funky hell <laughs> <laughs> like, it was insane and stuff and you know they really went for those like strong stereotypes that was in those 1970 movies that just came out to be hilarious in this movie and stuff and so when it comes to the cast you have David Gaiotoli? I don't know how to say his name. Voicing Batman. I think this is the first time he ever voiced Batman. He does a pretty good job. Every once in a while, they get that Batman lag voice that I like to um, characterize. It's kind of like when they try to do their Batman voice, it kind of lags towards the end and sounds kind of dull because they're trying to keep that voice because they're not used to it, you know? It's happened with other voice actors as well when they try to do that dark, brooding type voice. You have Kelly Who, who voices like Lady Shiva, Michael J. White as Bronze Tiger, which this is the second time he's been the Bronze Tiger. He was the Bronze Tiger in the Arrowverse on Arrow. This version is a whole lot cooler though, and especially how he expresses himself a whole lot more because this one's more of a vigilante, whereas the other one was a villain. And you have Jamie Chung as Jade and stuff, Cherish. And so, like, you got the man himself. Like, um, ah, what's his name? Mark Delacosca as, like, Richard Dragon. And, you know, that man is like a legend. He was the TV version of The Crow. He was on Iron Chef. He was in the third um, John Wick movie. He was in the third season of Warrior. So it was really cool that he got to play like a Bruce Lee type character. I'm not sure if he ever played, because like it, it was so interesting about that is that Richard Dragon, like I said before, is based on Bruce Lee, right? And he played the crow in the television show and he took over the role for Brandon Lee, who is the son of Bruce Lee, who died in the crow movie and stuff. And so that's like kind of interesting. He's played both like the son and like, you know, the father and everything. And he also starred in Warrior season three, which is a show based on the writings of Bruce Lee and stuff. So, yeah, and so for the most part, like, um, it has this really unique, like I said, 1970s vibe where if you really feel like you're like kind of like in the 1970s, but Hollywood 1970s, Batman in this is really interesting because it's kind of like, um, the people that he worked with back in the day, the train, they know his identity. Well, at least Richard Dragon does. It's never really explained how he figured it out, but he did. And the other ones didn't really know. I mean, they were shocked to find that out. But, like, his vehicles he uses in this movie are really interesting because the go undercover to... I can't say this name. Nada Pade or something like that. Um, Nada... Um, pa, um, Pade or something like that. It's that fictional Asian land in DC Comics. Um, instead of using the bat jet, he decides, or the bat wing, he decides to use a private jet. <laughs> and when it comes to the vehicle, like it's weird. After beating up the bad guys in his Batman costume, he later goes as Bruce Wayne to pick up like, you know, Lady, or well, after he picks up Lady Shiva as Batman and stuff, 
they're now driving in his regular car as Bruce Wayne. And this is when she finds out that he's Batman and Bruce Wayne and the one and the same. And his regular car acts like a Batmobile with all these like wacky gadgets and all this other stuff like ejector seats and you know, and it's just kind of like so wait, is this actually his car and the Batmobile? Is it just a car that subs as a Batmobile <laughs> and stuff like that? And so it has that really like, you know, his technology isn't like that, like high tech sci-fi looking and in modern day, it's very old school with old school cameras and stuff like that. And I really love the downgrade in like the technology. Now, the design of the animation, is really interesting. It has the DA, uh, wait, wait, DC and uh, yeah, DCAU look to it. Like it has more of that Batman Beyond drawing style and a little bit of the Justice League and stuff. So it really makes you feel home when you're watching that classic style of animation. Plus Batman's suit is very reminiscent of his classic suit, but in the Batman animated series and Justice League show where he's um, more leaner looking, um, has really long pointy ears, he has like the black on gray suit, but the black is really dark blue. It's just the blue highlights, the bat symbol with the yellow symbol in the middle and stuff like that. And so it's very old school and it's like, ah, oh, man, it feels like the DCAU and everything, but it's not. It's completely continuity um, because one is set in the set. Well, you know, the, the Batman animated series looked like it was set in the 40s, but this is set in the 70s. and. And then something happens at the end that makes you know, okay, yeah, this ain't like connected and stuff. And so like, it's cool to see like the 70s hairstyles and everything. But, you know, like I said before, it is kind of jarring when you don't really know who is the main center like hero of the show because in the flashbacks is Bruce Wayne and in the present day, it's Richard Dragon and stuff. Because when you go into the flashbacks, Richard Dragon, they don't really explore his background. And that's the downside of this movie because the movie starts off with him. And he is the one destined to defeat this great evil and everything. Like the sensei literally says, yo man, it's your destiny. And that's what I've been training you for and blah, 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 and stuff like that. So it's kind of like, okay, he is a center focused character. But when you go into his backstory, there really isn't one. He just trains at that temple with everybody else and he's just there. He doesn't even really look the way he does in the present day because his head is shaven and stuff like that. And he's a little bit more arrogant and stuff, but there's no like, you know, um, moral lesson with him. There's no like real true training. The sensei rarely talks to him. It's mostly just young Bruce Wayne who is getting mentored by the sensei and everything. You know, uh, and so that's what all the flashbacks center around. Bruce being very determined to break like, you know, this stone on wood, even though his hand is extremely bloody and everybody else has given up. He's very center focused. He doesn't want to speculate what's um, behind that door like everybody else is. Like, you know, you will think this is very much a Batman movie, but then you get to the present day and it's more of a Richard Dragon movie. Now this movie has a lot of great action, but sometimes it feels like there isn't that much action in the movie, which is completely fine because it's odd. I'm such an action junkie, but it's the quieter moments I found to be more interesting and stuff. The flashbacks were really interesting when you get to see all like the characters interact with each other. Like it's just really like something fascinating with the different personalities and how they talk to each other. And of course they're using like, you know, it's in that 1970 vibe and everything. So I really do appreciate the more quieter moments when it's just the characters interacting with each other and talking. The action, even though it is good, there's something odd about the um, the action. The, okay, here's the thing about DC animated movies. The action is always top notch. It always looks very realistic when they fight. They've gotten so much better from when they did like the TV shows and stuff. But here's the odd thing about this um, animation fight style. It's very 
blocky and very like stickish like every time they will throw a kick their legs are completely straight and it doesn't seem to be no um, fluid motion with it it's almost like their legs are popsicle sticks and stuff and that's what i think of when i see them fight it reminds me of batman beyond when they're fighting style and stuff so it's interesting that the animation style is similar to batman beyond and also the fighting style and everything but you know even though there's action it doesn't really feel like there's that much action like you have like a fight scene in the beginning a little bit um another one in the beginning um and then like you know there's a bunch of quiet stuff and then there's like a flashback and get some action and then there's the big climactic third act and everything with the action and for some reason i don't know why it just feels like even though there is plenty of action it feels like there's not and i don't know why I guess because the dialogue but the, the um the dialogue between the characters is so good that it kind of like you know um tricked my mind or something like that now the villains in this is cobra and i gotta say even though this version of cobra is cool i still enjoy the ones from batman beyond they really did the best versions of cobra in batman beyond especially with the whole chosen one prince thing that was very well done in batman beyond and it's a bit better it's done um, better in batman beyond than it is in the movie cobra just seems like a villain inserted in the movie you get a little bad story with them that's kind of fragmented throughout the entire movie so you do kind of know their motivation and you kind of don't and that's the problem with like the movie because it's kind of like you know you know cobra's there you know there's this mystery behind the door but you don't know what it is and everything but for whatever reason cobra is there and they want it and then you find out that there's like a lizard type god snake type thing behind it and it's like oh okay so then it starts to become like you know lazy writing after that because you don't really know cobra's real intentions but then you find out and it's like oh okay it's just a generic oh we worship snakes and now we want to unleash the snake god and you know and they have to like seal it back up so it becomes generic after a while and everything and not done as well as in like batman beyond and so like in the flashbacks like i said before it's like really cool we get the uh we see batman climbing up like this like snowy mountain meeting this sensei meeting the rest of the group and like you know he doesn't know what he wants to become but he knows it's going to be someone who's going to fight injustice and stuff and so like i said before like his lady shiva is um bronze tiger is cherish is richard dragon and then is i think is um johnny burr i think is no jeffrey burr and i don't really know who jeffrey burr is he's like you know from the comics i believe but like you know i don't know who the heck he is <laughs> and so you get to see them interact with each other like you know jade slash cherish is more like ooh, i wonder what's behind that door and she won't stop thinking about it and so you have richard who's kind of more like you know grumpy kind of and you know he's just he's been there the longest you had lady sheba who you think would be straight up evil in this but she's not um she's more like you know calm but with a bit of an attitude you have bruce who's very focused and then you have the bronze tiger who's just like the biggest stereotypical black dude ever from the 1970s movies and stuff and he don't like bruce wayne because bruce is rich and all this other stuff and it becomes a huge fight between like rice because <laughs> he just wants to eat all the rice up but then bruce got the last bit he's like look man i'll share and he's all like uh -uh, i don't want no handout for some rich boy and everything so then they fight and this is the first time where batman's not necessarily a mary suit this is before he became batman so he gets his butt whooped by the bronze tiger and everything and it's rare to see Bat, um, Bruce Wayne all like bloody and bruised up and everything. And so 
Lady Shiva is awarded like the Soul Breaker sword, and this sword is very powerful, but nobody really knows what like what it's supposed to exactly do. And it's kind of like a key that opens up that giant door gate type thing. Well, in the present day, you notice that like Jeffrey and Cherish is nowhere to be found, and now we know why. Turns out that like Jeffrey is part of Cobra and he went there to try to open up that gate So this is the, the sensei like this is what I've been preparing you all for and stuff like that and you know So he kills Jade slash Cherish because the gate needs a soul to open it up But it needs a sacrifice to close it well the things that are inside, the minions that are snake people, they eat the crap out of Jeffrey and stuff. They fight them off, and so Sensei decides I need to close the gate before like Naga comes out. And so everybody is upset. He's all like, this was his destiny to sacrifice himself to close the gate. He is proud of them and all stuff like that. So then we get like the present day where it's many, many years in the future. And so like now, um, oh no, wait, Judo Master. I think that's who Jeffrey Burr is, I think. Um, anyway, so anyway, we have this one guy and he's part of Cobra and he wants to like, you know, unleash Naga and everything like that. And so in the present day, we have Richard Dragon, who's like a international spy. He's infiltrating like, you know, the bad guys. And he realizes that the bad dude, Cobra, has inherited the gate. They like bought like the land and all this other stuff. And so all they need is the sword. And of course, Lady Shiva has it. So he recruits Batman. And somehow he just knows Batman's identity. Now, Bat uh, Bruce Wayne owns a casino of all things in this reality. So after they fight off Cobra and everything, you know, they go to get Lady Shiva. She kind of has like, this, I don't know really what she has. She kind of has this underground, I don't know if they're like villains or something like that. Or it's just like underground fighting, but whatever, she owns it. She has the sword and then all of a sudden Cobra attacks and they take the sword. This is when Batman takes off his costume and is Bruce Wayne and she realizes who he is. So it's a huge chase where she uses the ejector seat and hops on one of the Cobra's like motorcycles. And she has really good action scenes in like this movie. And, but she feels very one note as a, like a, a character. And so when they get away, this is later on when they recruit Bronze Tiger. And he has a dojo now. <clears throat> and he's trying to teach this young kid about what martial arts is important. It's, it's like in your mind and in your heart. And so like, you know, they all fly to the um, ancient land to stop Cobra. But he has a confession to them. After the sensei died, he just got pissed and he started beating up on bad guys. This bronze tiger is more of a vigilante and stuff. So he's been tracking down the people who murdered, like, you know, the sensei and trying to get, like, you know, the snake people out. And it led him to this one person. So he went to go kill this person, but it turned out to be a child. This child was the one who is the main bad guy of like, you know, the movie and stuff. The one who wants to release the snake god and everything. But he couldn't do it because it was a child. And Lady she was all like, you know, I would have done it <laughs> and everything. So in a way, they go there and he feels bad because he's all like, he could have stopped all this. In a way, they go there and stuff, and the bad guys have kidnapped a bunch of kids to sacrifice to open up the gate and all this other crap. So they fight off all the snake people, and it's really hard because they can regenerate their cells and everything. Not only that, but if you chop off like a limb, it grows into like a snake monster and everything. So it's really hard for them to defeat like, you know, the snake people, but eventually they do. Then when the main bad guy is like near the gate, they tell him, you know, you ain't got nobody to sacrifice this and that. So he takes his own life to open up, like, you know, the gate. And in comes, or out comes, the sensei. 
And right then and there, I knew, okay, yeah, Sensei perished years ago, so the demon thing took over his mind. So, uh, took over his body, and that's exactly what happened. So they have to fight, like, you know, the sensei and stuff like that. And so Richard Dragon, all of a sudden, him and the sensei have kind of like this dragon aura that they can unleash on each other. It's never really explained. Like I said, they really dropped the ball on Richard Dragon in this movie because you don't really know much about him and stuff and why he's the one destined to defeat the snake dude and everything but anyway they eventually stop him and he tells him like you know it's been you all along you are the key you are the one destined to defeat this evil and blah 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 blah, blah. but it's never explained why and that's the downside of this movie well you know the snake people are getting out the gate is open and it takes a sacrifice to close the gate so you think it would be Richard Dragon, but no, they had to get Batman his Batman moment. <laughs> and Batman sneaks away and goes inside the gate. And when they realize that, they follow him. And the door closes. He's pissed. All like, you know, I sacrificed myself for you all. And they're all like, ah, oh, we ain't gonna let you have all the fun. So the movie ends with Batman giving like a one-liner. And, you know, the movie ends with them, you know, you, you assume they're going to go fight all of these hundreds of, like, snake people and stuff like that. So, basically, they all sacrifice themselves to protect the world. But I'm all like, why give Batman that shiny moment in the movie when this is supposed to be about Richard Dragon? So, that was a downside of the movie because this is what they do when they insert Batman into, like, their movies and stuff. They kind of overshadow, he overshadows everybody because they need him to be the main person to save the day because they think that's what fans want. We got enough of that in the Justice League animation series. They don't have to keep doing that now and stuff. But, um, yeah, this is a very entertaining movie, a very good movie, and, it's, uh, and this movie embarrassed the New 52 movies that was lagging in, like, um, sales and everything, because nobody was really caring about those New 52 movies anymore, because they really started to suck. <laughs> and so, if you haven't seen this movie, you should really check it out. Uh, it's on HBO Max, it's on Tubi. And uh, it might be some other places where you can buy, but two these free. So, you know, happy Asian and Pacific Islander month, everybody. Alrighty. Well, I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.